Welcome to Defenders, the teaching class of Dr. William Lane Craig. Today, Foundations of Christian Doctrine, Part 1. And for many more resources, go to reasonablefaith.org. The class verse is 1 Peter 3.15, which says, Always be prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you to give a reason for the hope that is in you. Yet, do this with gentleness and respect. So according to Peter, we're all, as Christian believers, to be prepared to make a defense to any unbeliever who asks us why we believe what we believe, and we're to share that defense with gentleness and respect. And that verse motivates what we do in Defenders. Now, there are three purposes to Defenders class. Number one is to train Christians to understand, articulate, and defend basic Christian truths. Now, those three verbs are not just repetitive lawyer speak. Uh, rather, these uh, each indicate an important element of what we want to achieve in our training here. We want to understand basic Christian truths. We want you as Christians to have a solid grasp of what fundamental Christian teaching or doctrine is. Secondly, we want you to be able to articulate it. We want you to be able to uh, say what we believe in uh, a proper way, in an accurate way, so that you're not tongue-tied and at a loss for words when asked what you believe. You'll be able to articulate it clearly and accurately. And thirdly, to defend it, to say not only what you believe, but why you believe it. And so in the course of this, these um, Sunday school lessons, although our focus is on Christian doctrine, we will take uh, occasionally an excursus, uh, a detour, and we'll look at how to defend these claims. We'll look at some of the issues involved in the defense of the truths that we're studying. That's the primary purpose. Second purpose is to reach out with the gospel to those who have not yet come to know Christ, always being ready to give a defense to anyone who should ask for a reason for our hope. We want to be a place that is welcoming and open to seekers and unbelievers, agnostics, who have questions about the Christian faith and want to explore it. And so this class welcomes you if you are in that category. You can find a home here and express your doubts, your questions, your objections freely and openly in a, 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 an atmosphere ex of acceptance. And then thirdly, we want to be an incendiary fellowship of mutual encouragement and care. In a large mega church like Johnson Ferry, it's important to have a local group, a, a sort of church within the church, of people who know your first name and who care about you and are ready to pray for you and assist you if you're going through hard times, and for you to do that as well with others. And so we want to build a fellowship here of mutual encouragement and care that is incendiary. That is to say, it's like a fire which is burning brightly. And I like this image because if you take the logs in a fireplace and you pull them apart from one another, they soon grow cold and burn out. But if you gather those logs together and keep them uh, in, a, in a bunch, then they mutually uh, keep the fire going and keep the, the warmth going. And we want to have that kind of fellowship in this class, an incendiary fellowship in which we mutually encourage and care for one another. The first question that we need to ask is, what is Christian doctrine? I appreciate that for many of you, you don't even know what this is, uh, and yet we're going to study it. What is Christian doctrine? Well, the great church historian, uh, Yaroslav Pelikan, defined Christian doctrine in this way. He said, Christian doctrine is what the church believes and teaches. And I think that's as good a definition as any. Christian doctrine is what the church believes and teaches. So we're concerned here with what are the basic truth claims of Christianity. Now, why study Christian doctrine? Well, let me give you four reasons that are biblically based as to why every Christian ought to be engaged in the study of Christian doctrine. First, Every Christian is a theologian, not just academically trained, 
or uh, Christians or seminary professors, but every Christian is a theologian. Look at Ephesians chapter 4, verses 13 to 15. Ephesians chapter 4, verses 13 to 15. Here Paul speaks about equipping the saints for the work of the ministry, building up the body of Christ, and then in verse 13, until we all attain to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, to mature manhood, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, so that we may no longer be children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the cunning of men, by their craftiness in deceitful wiles. Notice Paul's goal here is to train Christians to grow into full Christian maturity. And that part of Christian maturity is doctrinal sophistication. It is to have an understanding of Christian doctrine so that we are not like children, uh, not like the waves of the sea that are tossed about to and fro by every wind of doctrine that comes along. So that it is part of Christian maturity to have a clear grasp of Christian doctrine. Look also at Galatians chapter 1, verses 6 to 9, for a similar emphasis upon doctrine. Galatians chapter 1, verses 6 to 9. Here Paul says, I am astonished that you are so quickly deserting him who called you in the grace of Christ and turning to a different gospel. Not that there is another gospel, but there are some who trouble you and want to pervert the gospel of Christ. But even if we or an angel from heaven should preach to you a gospel contrary to that which we preach to you, let him be accursed, as we have said before. So now I say again, if anyone is preaching to you a gospel contrary to that which you received, let him be accursed. Here Paul speaks in the most graphic and powerful terms about the importance of having right doctrine. If someone is preaching a different gospel, a different uh, account or message of Christ, Paul says, let that person go to hell, uh, because that is contrary to the true gospel of Jesus Christ, which is what Paul preached to the Galatians when he visited them. So again, Paul's emphasis is on correct doctrine uh, and understanding of the truth of the gospel. Finally, look at Titus chapter 1 and verse 9. Titus chapter 1 and verse 9. The context here is the qualifications to become an elder in the church. And he gives several qualifications to be an elder. And then in verse 9 he says, He must hold firm to the sure word as taught, so that he may be able to give instruction in sound doctrine, and also to confute those who contradict it. So the elders of the church, those who are models of Christian maturity among us, are to be able to give instruction in sound doctrine, and they're to be able to refute those who preach or bring false doctrine. Now, I don't know about you, but I don't see any reason to think that Christian maturity is to be the exclusive property of the elders in the church. I think every one of us ought to aspire to have the kind of character that is described here. So that even if we're not an elder, we would be qualified to be one. We want to have this kind of character that Paul describes here. And we've seen that uh, part of Christian maturity, which an elder exemplifies, is this firm grasp of Christian doctrine, to be able to teach doctrine and to be able to refute those who contradict it. So I think that every Christian ultimately is a theologian. Just in virtue of being a Christian, you are committed to a certain worldview. You're committed to things like the existence of God, the objectivity of moral values, the objectivity of truth, uh, the deity of Christ, his resurrection from the dead, his substitutionary atonement for our sins, the existence of eternal life, the hope of resurrection from the dead and of the personal return of Christ. As a Christian, you're committed to these things, 
And so why wouldn't you want to understand them? The question is not whether or not you're going to be a theologian. As a Christian, you're already committed to being a theologian. The only question is, are you going to be a good one or a poor one? Are you going to have a good grasp of Christian doctrine and theology or an immature and uh, childish one? Second reason for studying Christian doctrine is that right living presupposes right thinking about God. Right living presupposes right thinking about God. If you read Paul's epistles, you'll notice in them a very consistent pattern. In the first part of Paul's letter, he will lay out the doctrinal foundations of what he's trying to teach, the church to which he is writing. And then in the second half of the book, he will turn to matters of practical application. And Paul always waits until he has the doctrinal foundation laid before he turns to the practical instructions about Christian living. So to see this pattern, look, for example, at the book of Ephesians. Ephesians chapter 1 to 3 talk about Christian doctrine, about the uh, unity of the church, um, the uh, gathering of the Gentiles into God's elect body. Uh, and then he finally concludes with verse 20 of chapter 3, and then verse, uh, rather chapter 4, then is a sort of hinge that goes on now to the practical application to Christian living. And so in chapter 4, verse 1, he says, I therefore, a prisoner for the Lord, beg you to lead a life worthy of the calling to which you have been called, etc., etc., and goes into the practical application. Similarly, turn over to the book of Philippians for the same pattern. In Philippians, you have, again, the first three chapters are dealing with Christian doctrine, with teaching. And then, with chapter 4, he then now turns to his practical uh, application about how to get along and live with one another in the Christian fellowship. So, right thinking about God serves as a foundation for right living. If you really understand what God is like, what he wants from us, what it m means to follow Christ, then this is going to affect the way you live. Number three, the study of doctrine is an expression of loving God with all of our minds. The study of doctrine is an expression of loving God with all of our minds. Matthew chapter 22, verses 37 to 38. Matthew chapter 22, verses 37 to 38, is the story of one of the uh, Pharisees who comes to Jesus and asks him, what is the greatest commandment in the law? And in verse 37, Jesus replies, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the great and first commandment. As Christians, we are to love God not simply with our soul, not simply with our strength. We're to love him with our minds. And the study of his truth is one of the best ways in which you can express your love of the Lord by wanting to know what he is like and what his truth is. So it is a way of showing your love for God to disciple your mind to love and to know his truth. Study of doctrine is an expression of loving God with all of our minds. And finally, number four, Christ cannot be separated from truths about Christ. Christ cannot be separated from truths about Christ. Look at 2 John, verses 9 and 10. 2 John, verses 9 and 10. Here John is warning about false teachers. And he says, anyone who goes ahead and does not abide in the doctrine of Christ does not have God. He who abides in the doctrine has both the Father and the Son. If anyone comes to you and does not bring this doctrine, do not receive him into the house or give him any greeting. So here, John makes the doctrine of Christ the 
plumb line by which you measure persons coming to you claiming to be Christians or to speak in the name of Christ. And he says, if someone doesn't have the right doctrine, they don't have Christ. So don't be misled by persons who have perhaps a warm and fuzzy feeling about Christ and say, oh, I, I love Jesus or I love the Lord, but who has false doctrine. It is the doctrine which cannot be separated from the person of Christ. To have Christ involves having the correct understanding of who Christ is. Otherwise, you don't really have Christ. You just have an emotional experience. And therefore, doctrine is vitally important to the Christian life. Doctrine, without the Holy Spirit, leads to legalism. The Holy Spirit without doctrine leads to fanaticism. But doctrine with the Holy Spirit leads to true power in the Christian life. And this should be our goal, to have both the correct doctrine, the correct understanding of Christian truth, conjoined with a Spirit-filled Christian life. So that we have both Word and the Spirit. The Word without the Spirit is leads to the dead letter of legalism. The Spirit without the Word leads to fanaticism. But you put the word or, or doctrine together with the spirit and you have true Christian power. And so for those four reasons, I think it's vitally important that we as Christians study Christian doctrine, what the church believes and teaches. Now, uh, let me open the floor to any questions that you might have. Susie, right? Yes. Okay. Um, that's who I am. In a day when... Um almost every word has to be defined your first premise was that uh, doctrine is what the church believes would you define the church okay <laughs> right that's that's a good point by this uh, I mean the body of uh, redeemed persons persons who are genuinely born-again Christians so what you raise here is the important issue is that as we'll see in this class different denominations within the church will often believe and teach different things. And so there certainly are doctrinal differences among the brethren. And therefore, we'll need to try to sort out which is uh, the most plausible understanding of Scripture. And sometimes it'll be gray. Sometimes we won't be able to make a clear determination. Other times, I think, there are cases where we will be able to say that uh, this is the way we should properly understand this this doctrine. Daniel Bruner. You had uh, mentioned in, in letter B or number two, right living predisposes uh, or presupposes right thinking about God, that you have to have your doctrine correct first before you can have practical applications of it. And uh, there's a, a movement going about or there, based on a book that a lot of people in the church are reading in our church and churches all over this country called the Shack. Uh-huh. And um, the shack, the comments that I hear from a lot of people about the shack is the fact that it's given me a new vision of God. It's given me a new relationship with God. The problem that, that I have and I know a lot of other people have about that book is that doctrinally there's lots of heresies in that book. Um, they, they show God as a, <clears throat> as a black female. They see, show the Holy Spirit as an Asian female. And that's just the tip of the iceberg as far as the doctrinal problems within that book. But the comments that I hear is, oh, we overlook those issues about God, and yet there's such great message about redemption and healing and forgiveness. And even within our own church, we've got leaders in the church, pastoral staff, Sunday school classes, women's groups that are, and men's groups too, that are going through this book within our church to get out the positive aspects of the book. Uh -huh. However, the heresies in the book doctrinally are completely, you know, off base. Can you make any comments about the dangers of Christians going into a reading into books like that and hearing those kind of reading those doctrines, trying to achieve some sort of practical application when, like you said, doctrinally they're completely off base? Good. I, I'm glad you didn't ask me to give a response to that specific book because I have to confess I haven't read it. But I can respond, I think, to the general point that you're making. And I think Dan is quite right, especially for those of you who are young Christians and are not doctrinally sophisticated so that you don't spot doctrinal error 
when it appears. You need to be very cautious about what you read and not to read something just because it makes you feel good. Emotions can be very, very deceptive. Uh, and, and therefore, it's important. Well, I, I kind of emphasize what we're talking about in this class. We want you to be able to discern error when you see it so that when you read something, you won't be misled by it. Remember what Paul said about we don't want to be children tossed to and fro by every wind of doctrine. And I think that you're right, Dan, that too many Christians are so doctrinally uninformed that if something feels right and feels good, then they just assume that it's from God and that this is really wonderful, when in fact it may well be a teaching that is contrary to the truth. And I, I would emphasize even more than the po point B, point D, is that you can't separate Christ from the truths about Christ. If you don't come with the right doctrine, it's not really Christ that you've got. It's some counterfeit. Robert here. Bill, understanding correct doctrine, Paul preached that if anyone didn't understand the Christ that he was preaching, and if he came preaching another Christ, let him be accursed. Yes. How do we look at doctrine and salvation? I think doctrine, right doctrine, is essential to salvation. This was the point that I was making about not separating Christ from the truths about Christ. There are certain doctrines that have to be believed, it seems to me, in order to be saved. For example, um, look at uh, Romans chapter 10, where Paul says in verse 9, If you confess with your lips that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart, that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Now, I think those are not only sufficient, but necessary conditions of salvation. If someone doesn't believe that Jesus is Lord, um, for example, culty, Christian cults like Jehovah's Witnesses, who think that Jesus is just a kind of first created being, a sort of angelic being, or Mormons who do not think that uh Jesus Christ is the third person of the Trinity and therefore uh, of the same essence with the Father or other cultic groups, these groups, I do not think, are avenues of salvation. Someone can't believe those things and be a genuinely born-again Christian. Similarly, the resurrection, if someone denies that Jesus rose from the dead, they think that Jesus was just a, a good man, uh, and he his corpse rotted away in the grave, that person would not be regarded by Paul, I think, as a genuine Christian. So I would say that certain doctrines are essential to salvation. That doesn't mean, however, that all Christian doctrines are essential to salvation. There are many Christian doctrines that are secondary in nature and on which I think Christians can disagree. For example, a classic case would be, do you believe uh, in the pre-tribulation return of Christ or the post-tribulation return of Christ? Your salvation isn't going to hang upon the answer to that question. In fact, as I've said often in this class, I think every one of us has doctrinal errors. The chances that any one of us has a perfectly complete and correct body of doctrine is, is pretty remote. So all of us need to be humble about the secondary things, and be fast and, and firm on the foundational or cardinal doctrines. I'm Dennis. How do we decide, since there are always so many um, disagreements among various groups mm -hmm. of Christians, uh, among de uh, denominations, I can imagine a, sep a secular skeptic listening to you this morning say, well, what criteria do you use to know who's right? Boy, Dennis, that's a great segue into our first uh, uh, section for this class, which is Doctrine of Revelation. We're going to look at the Doctrine of Revelation, which is, at its essence, a question of authority. Who says what is right doctrine and what is wrong doctrine? And, and I'll argue God himself is the source of authority, and therefore we need to find out what God thinks about these things. How do we find that out? Through his revelation. And that revelation will be not only in nature, but also especially in the Bible, in his word to us. And then it will become a question of correctly understanding God's word. And we can then argue about that when we have different views, say, of baptism, or different views of 
the atonement or different views of divine eternity, we can say which of these square most faithfully with the teaching of Scripture. And I think in some cases we'll be able to come to some conclusions about that. In other cases, as I say, we'll hold our conclusions more tentatively and provisionally, recognizing that there can be honest differences among the brethren. My name is Ted. Uh, Dr. Craig, there in chapter 10 where you're reading, uh, it says you believe uh, in your heart. How do we know or how do we be sure that what our belief is is our heart belief, not our head belief? Uh, further down on that page, it has a, a, a verse there that's quoted in Joel and as well as in Acts. It says, for all who call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Now, for me personally, I put my salvation strictly on that one verse. And I don't know whether I chose him, whether he chose me before the foundation of the earth. I don't know. I don't know how to explain that. I don't understand it. I don't comprehend it. But I, when I get to heaven, he says, you missed the right verse. The verse was not all who called. It was all who called from Alabama or something well, like that, you know. Well, of course, the, the verse says what it does, and so you can place your confidence in it. But in answer to your question, I think that what Paul says back in Romans 8, Ted, has something to say about this. Look at chapter 8, verses 14 and following. Romans chapter 8, verses 14 and following. For all who are led by the Spirit of God are sons of God. All who are led by the Spirit of God are sons of God. For you did not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you have received the spirit of sonship. When we cry, Abba, Father, it is the Spirit himself bearing witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God, and fellow heirs with Christ. So I take it that it is fundamentally the witness of the Holy Spirit in the life of the believer that gives you the confidence that this is not just head knowledge or doctrinal affirmation, which as you quite rightly pointed is not enough. Being a Christian is not simply a matter of believing the right doctrines. I mean, the demons all believe the right doctrines, right? The demons know the truth. They believe the right doctrines, but they don't know God because they don't have this presence of the Spirit of God. So I would say that we need to examine ourselves to see if we have this inner testimony of the Spirit. If we do have this assurance of salvation, this, this sense of God's fatherhood of us, that we're his children, uh, then I think we can be confident that this isn't just head belief, but that we are genuinely born-again, regenerate followers of Christ. And that independently of your views on predestination and freedom of the will and all the rest of that. Hi, I'm Liz. Um, I was just wondering, on the subject of doctrine, would you consider some of the Catholic doctrines on these additional sacraments that the Protestant Church doesn't technically believe in, such as um, some of the requirements of baptism for salvation or um, confessional and um, such as that? Do you believe that that's a major shift of doctrine enough that it can determine whether you are saved or not. Uh -huh. No, I don't. Not those doctrines, anyway. I, I'm not a Catholic, obviously, uh, or I wouldn't be teaching here. But we do have Catholic brethren and sisters in our class who are welcomed. And uh, I don't think that doctrines pertinent to, for example, the number of the sacraments, whether marriage is a sacrament, for example, in addition to the Lord's Supper and, and baptism, are cardinal doctrines. Now, I do think that the doctrine of justification is a cardinal doctrine. That, I do think, is very important. How you are saved or what it does mean to be justified. And here, there, there has been ongoing a good deal of Catholic-Protestant doctrine because traditionally Protestants and Catholics have disagreed over this. And I think there's been some, some uh, coalescence on this issue, at least. I, I myself don't like the Catholic doctrine of justification as it's stated at Trent, the, the Council of Trent. Uh, and we'll talk about that when we get to this section. We have a lengthy section in which we'll look at different views of justification. But I've met Christian Catholics who interpret Trent in such a way as to make it acceptable. One of the Catholic members in the class came up to me after my lecture and he says, what you're teaching is what 
uh, Catholics believe. The, the, you know, he said, you're, you're right in line with us. And so he didn't see that there was any opposition there at all. So there are cardinal doctrines that are important, and I think Catholics and Protestants and Orthodox stand on the same footing on most of these. These are enshrined in the great ecumenical creeds. There are important Reformation truths pertinent to the nature of justification, salvation by grace alone, that I think are critical and need to be talked about. And, and here we need to be able to understand each other and to get past just formulas to understanding how you understand this formula and what it means to you. It appears that in our postmodern society right mm -hmm. now, that people have been trained up to believe that because nothing can be certain, that we cannot even have a certainty about the basic tenets of the faith. And I believe more than we'd like to realize, this is a pervasive thought on a lot of people. Because we can call into question certain of those doctrines that you mentioned today, and the lady asked about the Catholic uh, d disagreements in, between Catholic and Protestantism, it appears that they're beginning to apply that to all the doctrines, or many people are. Mm -hmm. Consequently, they don't believe the truth can really be known from this book, from the scriptures. And it casts doubt on the inerrancy of scripture at all because there's multiple interpretations. Or you think this way, I think that way. Who's to say you're right and I'm wrong in that? Would you just address how important that is to change the whole way we have this worldview, many people have that worldview, which prevents them from realizing that truth can be found in the Scripture. Well, I think that some people give lip service to postmodernism, which is a movement that denies the objectivity of truth and rationality and logic and sees uh, these different doctrines as just expressions of power on the part of different communities. It seems to me that that view is quite wrong and indeed self-defeating because if that were true then even their own statements would not be objectively true or false but would be just the result of their power grab by the postmodern community so that it's it's ultimately self-defeating i think though bob what lies at the root of a lot of this concern is an invalid equation of knowledge with certainty which I think we need to very firmly break. That is to say, people think that unless you are certain about something, you don't know it. And, and that is an understanding of what knowledge is that goes very far back. It's Platonic, in fact. This is what the ancient Greek philosopher Plato believed. And so Plato thought our knowledge of the world around us is uncertain and... Uh, really not knowledge at all, mere opinion. What is really knowledge is knowledge of mathematical truths and other necessary truths. And I think that this is a false equation that would land you in almost complete skepticism about everything because we're not really certain about almost anything. For example, take the belief that you have a head. Now, you might think you're certain that you have a head, but theoretically, you could be a body lying in the matrix wired up with electrodes and tubes to have this virtual reality experience of having a, a body, when in fact maybe you're just a brain in a vat of chemicals or something. But nobody takes that seriously. Of course we know that we have heads and that we're here in this, this church building and so forth. The point is that we shouldn't equate certainty with knowledge. You can know something without having 100% certainty of it. And so, uh, with regard to the correct interpretation of Christian doctrine, I think that we can know what Paul is saying in the book of Romans without needing to have absolute certainty of it. What we do is we weigh the arguments for and against, and then on the basis of the arguments, we make up uh, our mind as to what is the, the truth about reality. So, don't be sucked in by this invalid equation of knowledge with certainty. That's simply not correct. We can know things even if we're not psychologically certain of them. By the way, you can be certain of things that you don't know as well. I, I, my 17-year-old son was very certain of things. Trust me, Dad, he would often say, and that it would turn out to be wrong. So you can be certain of things and, and be wrong about it, not know it at all. So don't make this equation. And also, don't make the equation that just because you don't know something, there isn't any truth to be known. There are lots of truths that we don't know. We don't know whether Napoleon spat in a puddle on April 8, 1805. But either he did or he didn't. And that's true 
or false independently of whether we can know it. So even if our knowledge is uh, shifting and provisional, that doesn't mean there isn't any objective truth out there as postmoderns seem to think. Let me just close with this. Next time I'm going to talk about why we should study Christian apologetics as well as doctrine, and I'm going to challenge this assumption that we live in a postmodern culture and society. I think that we do not. In fact, I think this is a myth, uh, and next week I'm going to explain why I think that is a myth and why that undergirds the importance of our having training in apologetics as well. The copyright for the content of this recording is held by Dr. William Lane Craig. For more, go to reasonablefaith.org. Welcome to Defenders, the teaching class of Dr. William Lane Craig. Today, Foundations of Christian Doctrine, Part 2. And for many more resources, go to reasonablefaith.org. Last week, we opened the class by talking about reasons to study Christian doctrine. And what I explained was that the study of Christian doctrine is part and parcel of Christian maturity. If you want to be a mature Christian, following Christ, being a disciple of Christ, then you will have a desire to learn and master Christian doctrine, which just is the truth about uh, God, salvation, the world, Christ, and so forth. Now, in addition to that, though, we're going to be talking in this class not simply about Christian doctrine, but also about apologetics. And so I'd like to share three reasons as to why I think the study of apologetics is also important. I think that apologetics is extremely valuable, and it may even be necessary if the gospel is to be effectively heard in Western society today. Our Western culture has become deeply post-Christian. It is the product of the Enlightenment, uh, which was a movement in 17th and 18th century Europe that threw off the institutional church and the monarchy in the name of free thought. That is to say, the pursuit of truth by unbridled human reason alone, unfettered by the authority of church or state. Now, it's by no means inevitable that such free thought has to lead to atheistic conclusions. Anthony Flew, that Dennis is going to talk about, is an example of someone who claimed that he followed free thought, followed the evidence where it leads, and he came to believe in God. But nevertheless, it has been the overwhelming impact of the Enlightenment mentality on Western culture that today Western intellectuals generally do not consider uh, theological knowledge to be possible. Theology is not a source of genuine knowledge, and therefore theology is not a science. Uh, science comes from the Latin scientia, which just means knowledge. Knowledge is not a science. It's not a source of, uh, uh, of, or theology is not a science, not a source of knowledge, and therefore reason and religion are at odds with each other. The deliverances of the physical sciences alone are taken to be the arbiter of truth. And the confident assumption by Western secularists is that if you follow reason uh, unflinchingly toward its end, then you will arrive at a purely naturalistic picture of the world, uh, a picture which will be atheistic or at best agnostic. Now, why are these considerations of culture important? Well, very simply because the gospel is never heard in isolation. It's always heard against the cultural backdrop in which a person is raised. And a person who is raised in a culture in which the gospel is still an intellectually viable option for thinking men and women will be open to the gospel in the way that a secularized person will not. Um, to give an example, suppose that you were approached on the street by a devotee of the Hare Krishna movement with his shaved head and saffron robes, and he invited you to believe in Krishna. Now, you would probably think such an invitation was bizarre, uh, freakish, maybe even funny. But if that were to occur to someone on the streets of New Delhi or Mumbai, it would probably be taken very seriously. 
and give them serious cause for reflection. Why? Because it is culturally accepted in India to have Hindu beliefs. In this culture, it's not. And what awaits us here in North America if our slide into secularism remains unchecked is already previewed in Europe. Although the majority of Europeans still maintain a nominal affiliation with Christianity, uh, only about 10% of Europeans are practicing believers, uh, and less than half of those are evangelical believers. The most significant trend in European religious affiliation has been the growth of those classed as non-religious. It went from effectively 0% of the population in 1900 to over 22% today. And as a result, evangelism is immeasurably more difficult uh, in Europe than it is here in the United States. Uh, as one who has lived uh, with Jan for 13 years in Europe and spoke on European campuses, uh, both in the East and West, I can testify how hard the ground is. Missionaries have to work for years to just win a handful of converts. And the problem is, of course, is that they are living in a cultural milieu in which the gospel just isn't even taken seriously as an intellectual option. And that's why people who depreciate the value of apologetics because, quote-unquote, nobody comes to Christ through arguments. People who say that don't understand the wider picture that apologetics contributes to. It is the broader task of Christian apologetics to create a cultural milieu in which the gospel can still be heard as a legitimate option for thinking people. People may not come to Christ through the arguments, but the arguments give them permission to believe, as it were, the intellectual permission to believe when their hearts are moved by the preaching of the gospel and the Holy Spirit. In his article, Christianity and Culture, the great Princeton theologian J. Gresham Machen wrote this. He said, false ideas are the greatest obstacles to the reception of the gospel. We may preach with all the fervor of a reformer and yet succeed only in winning a straggler here and there if we permit the whole collective thought of the nation to be controlled by ideas which prevent Christianity from being regarded as anything more than a harmless delusion. Unfortunately, Machen's warning, which was issued in 1913, went unheeded, and biblical Christianity retreated into the closets of fundamentalism and cultural isolationism, withdrew from the academy and from society at large. And it's only been in recent decades now that we've begun to reemerge. And now I believe we are living at a time in history at which huge doors of opportunity stand open before us. We are living at a time when Christian philosophy is undergoing a veritable renaissance and it's revitalized natural theology or arguments for the existence of God. We're living at a time when modern science is more open to the existence of a transcendent creator and designer of the universe than at any time in recent memory. And we are living at a time in which biblical criticism has largely established the credibility of the outlines of the New Testament life of Jesus so that the Gospels are now regarded once again as serious historical sources for the life of Christ. Uh, this is a tremendously exciting time in this transition from the 20th to 21st century to be alive and working in apologetics. And I think that we're well poised intellectually to regain lost ground and to help reshape our culture in such a way that the gospel uh, can be heard as a legitimate option for people today. Now, some of you might be thinking, but don't we live in a postmodern culture in which these appeals to uh, rational arguments and evidence are no longer effective, since postmodernists deny the objectivity of truth and logic and rationality. These arguments and, and apologetic evidences aren't effective. Rather, in a postmodern culture, we should simply share our narrative uh, and invite people to participate in it. Well, I think that this kind of thinking represents a disastrous misdiagnosis 
of Western culture. The idea that we live in a postmodern culture is a myth which is propagated in our churches by misguided youth ministers. In fact, a postmodern culture, when you think about it, is an impossibility. It would be utterly unlivable. Nobody is a postmodernist when it comes to reading the labels on a bottle of aspirin and a box of rat poison. If you've got a headache, you better believe that texts have objective meaning. So, when you talk to people, they're not postmodernist about matters of science and technology and engineering. They're, po- they're, they're relativistic and pluralistic when it comes to matters of religion and ethics. But you see, that's not postmodernism. That's modernism. That's exactly the sort of modernistic view that Andre described, where science gives us the truth about natural reality, and things that cannot be proved by science, like ethics and religion, are just expressions of personal taste and emotive feelings. We live in a culture which remains deeply modernist at its core. In fact, I think that postmodernism is one of the craftiest deceptions that Satan has yet devised. Modernism is dead, he says. Ignore it. You don't need to fear modernism any longer. Just share your narrative. And so we lay aside our best weapons of logic and evidence. Meanwhile, modernism, pretending to be dead, comes back around in the guise of postmodernism uh, in a new fancy costume. And Satan says to us, your, your arguments are no longer valid against this new challenger. Lay them down. Don't share them. Just tell your narrative. And so we have nothing left to commend the truth of what we share. If the church adopts this strategy, then what will happen is that in the next generation from now, Christianity will be reduced to just one more voice in a cacophony of competing voices, each one sharing its own narrative, and none commending itself as the objective truth about reality. That will be given to us by scientific naturalism, which will continue to shape our culture's view of how the world really is. So, uh, I think that the idea that we live in a postmodern culture and that we must therefore abandon rational apologetics and evidence is a, a suicidal, and I mean that seriously, a suicidal prescription for the church. Now, of course, it goes without saying that in doing apologetics, we need to be relational and uh, humble and invitational rather than argumentative and mean-spirited and defensive. Uh, we saw that First Peter 3.15 says that we should share the reason for the hope within us with gentleness and respect. And you don't have to be a postmodernist to exemplify those kind of biblical virtues. So I find that it's very important, I think, that we not allow ourselves to be deceived into thinking that we no longer live in a modernist culture in which it is a, it is vital to present a rational uh, case for the objective truth of the Christian gospel. I think that we, we do live in that kind of culture, and it is vital that we shape the culture in such a way as to preserve a milieu in which the gospel can be heard as a legitimate option today. So the, the first thing is shaping culture. The second reason to study apologetics is for strengthening believers. Strengthening believers. Apologetics is not only vital to shaping our culture, but it's also vital in the lives of individual persons. And I think one of those individual roles will be strengthening Christian believers. When I was studying for my doctoral exams in theology, Jan and I lived for a summer in Berlin, in Germany. And while we were there, we were visited by Anne Kimmel and her new husband, Will. Now, those of you who remember Anne Kimmel will uh, know that she was an extremely sentimental and emotional women speaker. She would speak to large groups of women audiences and in a matter of minutes would have them all reduced to tears by her stories and anecdotes that she told. Uh, She was a unique person. She would meet total strangers 
and sing to them little ditties about the Lord and uh, share her little stories with them and lead them to Christ. And she would tell story after story of how even hard-boiled academics would be melted by her little ditties and stories and, and would be brought to the Lord. Well, as we were sitting around the uh, dinner table one evening at the apartment in Berlin, I, I thought, well, I'll profit a little bit from her experience as a speaker. Uh, and I said to her, Anne, how do you prepare for your messages? And she said, oh, I don't prepare. And I said, you don't prepare? And she said, no. And I said, well, then what do you do? And she says, oh, I just share my struggles. And I thought, she just shares her struggles. Here I was killing myself in years of study to earn this doctorate in theology in Germany, and she doesn't prepare. And this really shook me because there was no denying the effectiveness of her ministry. I thought, am I just barking up the wrong tree? Here is all of this study a waste of time. Why am I doing all this study when all I have to do is just share my struggles? <laughs> well, we returned to the States uh, that fall to do a sabbatical at the University of Arizona in Tucson. Uh, where a former classmate lived. And I shared with him one day about how my conversation with Ann Kimball had sort of taken the wind out of my sails. And he said something to me that was very reassuring. He said, Bill, someday those people that Ann Kimmel has brought to the Lord are going to need what you have to offer. And I thought, yes, that is exactly right. Emotional experiences can only carry you so far and then you're going to need something more substantive to back it up. And apologetics can help to provide some of that substance. When I travel around the country speaking in various churches, I meet parents all the time who come up to me after the service and say something like this, Oh, if only you'd been here two or three years ago. Our son or our daughter had questions about the faith which no one could answer and now he or she is far from the Lord. And it just breaks my heart to meet parents like this. The fact is that our Christian high school students and college students are intellectually assaulted in secular high school and university by uh, overwhelming relativism and every manner of non-Christian philosophy and ism. And we dare not send these kids out to battle armed with rubber swords and plastic armor. We need to prepare our kids for war. And that's why I'm so glad for those of you who are high schoolers that you're in this class. I, I value your presence in this class. And, and I value the presence of any of you who are parents of young children because I'm convinced we've got to train our children in apologetics from the youthful age up. Begin simple, get more profound as they grow. It's not enough anymore to just read Bible stories to our kids. They need doctrine and they need apologetics. And I, I have to tell you the truth, I find it very difficult to understand how parents today can risk having children without having had some training in Christian apologetics. Uh, I, I think it's that important. So strengthening believers would be one way in which apologetics can also be of help. Let me mention finally just one last point, and that would be evangelizing unbelievers. I think most people would agree that apologetics is useful in strengthening believers, but many will say that apologetics isn't any good in evangelism. Nobody comes to Christ through arguments. I don't know how many times I've heard this said. Now, this dismissive attitude toward apologetics is certainly not the biblical view. As you read the Acts of the Apostles, you discover that it was the standard procedure of people like Paul to argue for the truth of the Christian faith. He would go into the synagogue and he would argue with them, trying to persuade them that Christ was the Messiah. He would rent the Hall of Tyrannus and for two years deliver daily lectures there, debating and arguing with anyone who would come to hear him speak. So the apostles were not at all afraid to argue for the truth of the Christian faith. And that doesn't mean they didn't trust the Holy Spirit to bring people to Christ. Rather, it means they trusted the Holy Spirit to use their arguments 
and evidence to help bring people to Christ. And I think that those who, who believe that apologetics is not effective in evangelism just frankly haven't done enough evangelism. I, I think that probably they tried sharing the arguments a few times and they were unsuccessful, and so then they draw this sweeping conclusion that apologetics isn't useful in evangelism. And I think they're just guilty, uh, or victims rather, of, of false expectations. When you think that only a minority of people who hear the gospel will respond to it affirmatively, and that only a minority of those who do so will do so for intellectual reasons, well, we shouldn't be surprised that most people will not be convinced by our apologetic arguments, just as they're not convinced by the preaching of the cross. So we, we shouldn't have the expectation the unbeliever is just going to roll over and play dead when he hears our great apologetic case for Christianity. Of course he's going to argue back. Think of what's at stake for him. Think of what you're asking him to do. So we shouldn't be surprised if we meet resistance. Now you might say, well, but then why bother with that minority of a minority with whom apologetic arguments are effective? Well, first of all, because every person is precious to God. Every person is a person for whom Christ died. And like a missionary who was called to reach some obscure people group, the Christian apologist feels burdened to reach that minority of persons who will respond to uh, intellectual argument and evidence. But secondly, and here I think the case differs radically from the obscure people group, this people group that can be reached through apologetics, though small in numbers, is huge in influence. Just think of the influence a man like C.S. Lewis has had. He was one of those people. And think of the reverberation that that one man's conversion continues to have. I find that the people who resonate most with my own apologetic work tend to be engineers, doctors, or people in the medical profession, and lawyers. These are some of the most influential people in our culture today. And so reaching this minority will have a huge impact for the kingdom of God. And in any case, I, the, the general conclusion that apologetics is ineffective in evangelism, I think, is just hasty and overdrawn. Lee Strobel remarked to Jan and me some time ago that he has lost count of the number of people that have come to Christ through his books, The Case for Christ and The Case for Faith. I believe that... Uh, when you share your personal testimony and are prepared to give good answers and evidence for what you believe, that the Spirit of God will use this to draw people to himself, and we've seen it happen ourselves all the time uh, when I speak on university campuses. So, to wrap up this section of the introduction, and I think that uh, Christian apologetics is a vital part of Christian discipleship. It helps to shape the broader culture in which we live, to make the gospel an option for thinking people. It strengthens believers in their faith, and it is also useful in evangelizing unbelievers. And for all of these reasons, I am unashamedly, uh, unapologetically enthusiastic about Christian apologetics. So what we'll be doing in this class is studying Christian doctrine, and then as we confront apologetic issues along the way, we'll take an excursus and discuss what good reasons or objections there are uh, to that Christian doctrine, uh, and, and then resume our study of doctrine. So that completes my introductory comments. The next time that I'm with you, we will begin the first part of our class, which will be on the doctrine of revelation, in which we'll study how God reveals himself and his truth to us. The copyright for the content of this recording is held by Dr. William Lane Craig. For more, go to reasonablefaith.org.